Before I formally introduce today's guest, um, I want to note that we have a bifurcated service because we're celebrating the joyous promise of Pilgrim's School's Baccalaureate Sunday. And we're going to be hearing from a man who was younger than some of them are now, who had the dreams that fill their hearts now blocked for him. And this is also a day when we're also noting uh, gun violence in America, and that's also one of the things that we'll be talking about. It's a fitting paradox for this sermon series that's called Recalled to Life, which is the title of the first chapter of Charles Dickens' Tale of Two Cities, which of course begins, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was the season of light, it was the season of darkness, it was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. Like Joseph in the scripture reading, uh, our guest today, in 1991, when he was 16 years old, he was convicted of a shooting murder and then served 20 years in prison until 2011 when his innocence was proved and he was released. Let's hear now how he was recalled to life. Please welcome Frankie Carrillo. It's always, first of all, let me say, it's always a delight when I see you because you're always smiling and you are always so positive and yet I know what you have gone through. So first let's begin with you telling everyone how you came to be arrested and convicted. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. It's, I've driven by this church many of times and it's reminded me of a place I'd spent many years in which was Folsom Prison, at least from the outside. <laughs> I know it's funny, right? Well, and I was thinking about when they were doing the wonderful uh, rendition of I Shall Be Released, I was thinking that had one meaning to Frankie and another meaning to the graduates. <laughs> you know, it's obvious that the inside of the church looks a lot different than uh, the inside of Folsom Prison. But I'll, I'll tell you that um, I was a sophomore in high school living in Maywood, not too far from here. I was uh, the child of a divorced family being raised by my father at the time. Um, seven years prior to that, my parents had separated and divorced. So my father uh, raised uh, the children. So at this point, it's my little brother and I, my father made up our household. Our, the school that I attended, uh, I needed to take uh, two, I'm sorry, three buses to get there and, and three buses to get home. I was going to school in uh, Montebello Shore High School. In, my, in the way I like to describe my life, it was a pretty bland and normal little life. There was not, I had a bike, um, I had friends, I had my family, but I was 16 years old, and so there wasn't really much I can, can give you besides that. But all that changed on the morning of, of January 24th, 1991, when I was uh, rudely awakened by the sheriff's department who came and knocked on our door. I opened the door, and they stormed into our um, home, and they arrested me ultimately and ransacked our, our, our things. And when I got to the station is when I was officially arrested, and I was uh, questioned about this case that happened six days prior. And I was really adamant about the fact that they had the wrong kid. I was expecting my father maybe to show up, and they never brought him in, but I continued with, with interrogation. And they wanted to know where I was, and I said I had gone to school that morning, um, came back that afternoon, did some chores around the house, used the phone, father came home, we had dinner, we went to bed, the next day we went to work, which was a Saturday. Very easy to recall. And I think they mocked me, you know, called me a liar, said, you know, tell us the truth. We know there's a witness that said that he saw you. And what they said they saw me do was uh, be the trigger man in a drive-by shooting that happened in Linwood, a town I used to live prior to living in Maywood, maybe about 20 or maybe even less miles away from each other. And the story, um, my, my story that was very, um, my alibi that was very simple um, was minimized and I was taken to juvenile hall. So that was my official, the story of the day of my arrest and why I was arrested. And you had been expecting more help from either your father or others in your community. And 
kind of a general response from the adults, the grown-ups. And, yeah. and that, was not, that was not forthcoming? You know, what, what, what happened was that here in California, if you're a juvenile but being uh, tried of a serious crime, they can try you as an adult. So they tried me as an adult. It was a murder, of obviously a very serious crime. And when I heard adult court, I figured, you know, this is a serious business here. There's going to be a judge, there's going to be lawyers, there's going to be advocates. I'll have an attorney representing me. And I really was leaning, and he leaning heavily on, a, on a, some advice my father gave me as a boy, which was, if you ever have any trouble, there's ever a situation, go to an adult, which is advice that my father gave, and I'm sure many other parents have, have given throughout the years. And so I felt that I was in the right place. I was going to be in front of a judge who I, I was respecting, the process that I had wasn't familiar with, but I figured this is, you know, this will be, all be worked out. And um, the trial commenced, there was a jury trial, and ultimately there was a conviction. Um, but I was definitely, as a young boy, leaning heavily on the advice my father gave me, which was the adults would step in and, and help you. And didn't you even go to the step of hiring an investigator to find out who the actual shooter was? There was an investigator hired to represent, um, to help my attorney, you know, represent me and you know the work was done um, but the evidence was never turned over so it was a very very muddy investigation very muddy defense because as I recall you telling me the investigator was a friend of knew the person who actually did the shooting so once the investigator found out who the person was he then concealed the evidence exactly so that you were the one who then took the fall for that by this point, I was already convicted by jury trial, and so I think the investigator took the position of, it's too late. And um, many years later, he came forward and, and said what we're talking about now. And so it was helpful, but at the time, it could have, I, I think it could have changed the outcome of the case. Yeah, and let's, go to, and let's go to the end of, you served 20 years, and at the age of 37 were released. How did that come about? Well, that came about of not giving up. You know, for 20 years of my incarceration, I would say the first couple years were, were shock. I wasn't able to completely understand what was going on, mainly because of my age, which shielded me. In many ways, being naive to the system helped. But also, um, just fortitude, just finding ways to say, I'm not going to accept this. And as years went on and my maturity, um, I, I, I welcomed, welcomed the process of being um, now a young adult and the responsibilities that new ideas and new strengths. I, I just continued to petition um, lawyers, judges, Oprah Winfrey, anyone who I thought would be able to help. And that went on for 15 years. And that was, that was sort of my, my lane of trying to be heard and make some attention, get some attention for my case. But I was also having to survive the, my, my life, my, my space, which was very difficult. And eventually you came in contact with the Innocence Project which some of us have heard about, which is an organization that was founded by Barry Sheck, who was one of the OJ attorneys. That's right. And they are devoted to going back to cases that have maybe been decided incorrectly and seeing if there's DA evidence or any other kind of evidence that can establish the innocence of someone who's been wrongly convicted, and that's what happened in your case. Ellen Eggers, which is a uh, rogue attorney, she was working, you know, for the, actually she was a uh, public defender in Sacramento at the time, working for death penalty clients. She's the one who heard of my story, and then ultimately the, the Northern California Innocence Project joined in, and Morrison Forster, which is a big international law firm, got involved. It took them five years to untangle an injustice, which was striking down the witnesses who came to court and lied against me, um, reinvestigating attorneys, prosecutors, um, I think as far as maybe talking to jurors. And during, the, during this, this reinvestigation, the evidence that was used against me were these boys. There was, uh, the youngest was 15 and the oldest was 18 years old. And they came to court and recounted what they thought they saw, which was this, this shooting. And then added the fact that the sheriff's department had coerced him to say in the story. And so it was a, it was a, a, a tainted investigation. So these were now men who were coming forward, and you know, I, I, the person sitting in prison was very hopeful that these men would, would be truthful, and, and thank God they were. And so you were released in 2011. I was. <laughs> okay, and, and um, what I wanna get to is you served for 20 years. How did you sustain, I mean, many of us 
if we're driving down the 405 and we try to change lanes and someone cuts, its, <laughs> cuts us off, we are tremendously angered and it's like the end of our lives and we go through these kind of petty incidents all the time in our lives. But, and I hope that no one has the incident that, that you went through, but you went through something genuinely, genuinely horrific and yet you have emerged as a very sunny, optimistic guy and always very positive. And so uh, what, maybe if you could tell us about how, what kept you going, what, yeah. what, what in your heart led you to believe that life was still going to be something good for you? Because my life was interrupted at such a young age, I felt that what I had to recall from the life that I, prior to my arrest, my youth, my time with my family, my time with my classmates, I felt it was very limited. You know, what I, movies that had impacted me, music that had, I had listened to, real life experiences. But the one thing that really motivated me and that I never forgot about, and in some cases I remembered, were advice, advice people gave me. And it's funny what incarceration does to you, especially when you're just in your cell thinking about, thinking about life and thinking about who you ran into and what conversations you might have had. I started recalling conversations with my third grade teacher. Not the entire conversation, but I remember Suzanne Taxter, um, who was my third grade teacher, would give me just random advice about, um, she was a martial artist and she would tell me, Frankie, come, come over to my desk and show me how to, how, do, how would you punch? And I would, I would tuck my, my thumb under my fingers, and she's like, no, 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 don't do that. Close your, your, all your fingers and bring your, punch, your thumb around your fingers and, and random advice. And I would remember my father, <laughs> right? But I remember my father, what was, what was um, a little, little bit more important than, than that piece of advice, my dad was the kind of man who would embarrass us as boys, as, as children when I was a kid. You know, he had a pickup truck and we would be going somewhere and he would see something that was trashed or he would go to a, a yard sale and bring back some lawnmower or some bike that was, I thought was a piece of junk. And he would take it home and in his garage, in his free time, he would tinker and he would turn what I would interpret as, a, as trash into something workable and, and, and beautiful. So he would be like, he would refurbish things. And I would watch him and sometimes help him, and sometimes run from him, but I would, I saw that. Many, many years later during my incarceration, this experience became very important for me because I felt that I had also been junked. And I think, I, and I think that this impulse which you still have to this day to take things and wish to transform them in a way you are taking inanimate objects and you are recalling them to life. And that's a metaphor that you developed for yourself of recalling yourself to life. I remember you talking yeah. to me before when we met about one of, the, one of the things that stayed with you was that you had been a Cub Scout and a I Boy was, Scout. I was. And about how in schools in those days, the day would often begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. And I feel like there are, from my times of talking to you, I feel like there are lessons that were instilled deeply in you that you did not even realize that someday you would have to call upon. Exactly. And many of those lessons are either lessons that many of us have stopped, have, have forgotten, or we've stopped teaching our kids so that they do not know them. And, and I feel like a message that you have in this time since you've become free and have been talking to people, a message that is exceedingly worthy in this time when people are questioning the values of their society. So I, I now have a, a, a married and have two small children, a five-year-old and a two-year-old, and my son Akiva, who I hope attends Pilgrim here in the future, he uh, just recently said, um, he's like, Dad, why don't, why don't we make it instead of make it? Make it instead of buy it, I'm sorry. And I was like, man, you know, this is, is where'd you get that from? You know, I wonder if just me tinkering in my own garage now is, is rubbing off on my child. But, I, you know, it, it's, it's interesting how things are passed on. And I, and I hope that it's sort of a parable for me is the way I use it, how this all sort of came to be. 
But I'll, I'll tell you that incarceration is very, is very difficult. Obviously, it's very difficult. You go from a state of being a young, bright child to someone whose name is taken away from you. Uh, you're, you're not allowed to dream. Your, your existence is very limited. And under those circumstances, and, and I guess I'm trying to pat myself on the back here, I, I was dreaming of the day when I, this boy who comes from an immigrant set of parents, who had a very humble beginnings, a very, um, maybe no equity in my family, was going to prove that the criminal justice system, the Constitution of the United States, law enforcement, and maybe even society as a whole, had let me down. Because that's what I was dreaming of. I needed to make sure that those things were proven. And if they were, then I would regain my life because my case would be overturned. Things would be pointed out that went wrong. And maybe people who were involved would, would have, to come, have to apologize, I suppose, right? Or at least feel bad about what happened. And it was, you know, I can recall being mocked by my fellow prisoners at time and maybe even family members um, when they would hear from me and, and I would write them about this, this, this idea, this hope, this dream that I had of someday getting out. And some people would say, you know, we, we don't have any money. We can't hire an attorney for that. It's too big of a, it's too big of a task. And my roommates or fellow prisoners would say, you know, Frankie, just give it up, man. It's not going to happen. And when I think about faith and I think about hope and I think about these small conversations that germinated and became these ideas in my mind that gave me hope, I, I can only wonder what we all possess in our own lives, what we heard, what we can say to somebody else, what, what hasn't happened yet will happen. And so when I think about just what you're saying, Scott, it motivates me to say, look, I, I obviously went through a very difficult time, but it's not the end of the story. You know, there's so much more life ahead. Right. It's a, it's a, a lot of, the, the song that you are telling is in a minor key, but it can come to a major key resolution. <laughs> and, and, and that's what I think, I feel, uh, tell, tell us this, when you first were released and you got through, and after the euphoria mm. of having your freedom restored, how did you begin to structure your future life? My, my parents weren't educated. My dad went, went up to third grade in Mexico, and my mother, I think, the first grade. But I always, looked, I always looked at education as a pathway to, at least out of where we were, somewhere else, a brighter place. And the people who came to my rescue were these attorneys who were bright and, and excited about, the, about life. And the, what, the one thing they had in common was that they were all college educated and obviously they were, they were attorneys, so they had a profession. And so when I came home, I wanted to mimic their, what they had done in their own lives. And so a friend of mine who knew the president of Loyola Marymount University made, made a call, spoke to Maria, his secretary, and eventually talked to David Bertram. And I had an appointment with him, and he was the dean of the law school, so he knew, he knew about my story, but he wasn't aware that I was going to ask him if I, if I could attend his school. You know, he's now the university uh, pr uh, president. And one thing led to another, and the year that I came home, I became a full-time full -time student at Loyal Marymount University. And being on, on the campus, which really reminded me of prison, and not to be funny here, <laughs> but as, as you guys will see, you'll, you'll, you're on your way there. <laughs> prison, the university gave me structure that I was used to. It gave me a timetable for classes. It, there was no barbed wire, but there was definitely a campus. It was a, you know, the yard, the prison environment that I had become so familiar with. But what was completely different was that the university was very loving, compassion, driven for empowering you to be the best that you can be. And when I think about, there was a lot of hiccups there, a lot of, a lot of stumbling when I came home. One example, very briefly, is that the, the day after my, my release, we had a, a celebration luncheon with my attorneys and I was the first man to order, all the ladies ordered first, and it was, it was my turn. And we went, I think we went to like Cheesecake Factory, and I was, you know, multiple pages of all the things you can have. And I started sweating. And I was, you know, I was just nervous about what, are, what, did I, what was I going to eat? You know, what was I going to select for the first time in my entire life? I had to make a decision about what did I want to eat. 
And I'm embarrassed to say that I said, oh, I'll have what she's having. Because I, because I couldn't make up my mind. And I'll tell you now what happened was that I cried myself to bed that night because I was so embarrassed that something so minor, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. Then I realized that for all those years, I had been fed what, what was being served. You would walk into this dining room, there was a, 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 a cutout in the wall, you would walk up to the little hole and they would hand you a tray and you would go and sit down and eat it. And I realized that whatever mechanism, part of the brain that we use to make decisions was dormant. And so I'm not, I'm, I'm not embarrassed to say that, but as, you know, it's been eight years since, and I can order sushi like no one's business, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and many other things. Right. <laughs> and he graduated from college. And so very quickly now, so <laughs> as you look to the future now, what, what, what's on the horizon for you? What do you want to do with I want to be the best life? father. I mean, that's, fatherhood's a, and parenthood's a, it's a lifelong um, commitment here, but I, I want to be of service. I, I recently applied for a job here in Los Angeles to be an executive, executive director. I would love politics someday. I, I think that my experience, I mean, I, and I hate, to, I'm, I hate to say it this way, but the fact that I was able to survive my experience really lends itself to a leadership position. One of the things I love about you is after all that this society has done to you, the notion of a future of service in some sort of not-for-profit or in some sort of elected office, that you still believe in this country even when the country did not serve you. And that makes you eminently qualified to be contributing and so please, if you uh, ever announce a, 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 a candidacy for an office, please let us know. I think there are many people here who would want to help you. <laughs> Thank you. And, and the other thing of your story that is so fascinating to me as we conclude is the lawyers who helped you get free were finally the grown-up showing up in your life. The, the and um, yeah, you're right. So maybe let, let us conclude on this note. Uh, I, I hope that all of us, and particularly the graduates here, are spared having to go through the experience that Frankie went through. But without that experience, I hope that we all can become who he has become today. And may our examples that we show the rest of the world turn the worst of times into the best of times, make an age of foolishness into an age of wisdom, and a season of light from one of darkness that from a winter of despair may bloom a spring of hope. Please join me in thanking Frankie Correa.